because somebody's already asking. Are you seeing anything? Hi, everyone. Hi. <laughs> Okay. Hey, y'all. We're on? <laughs> yep. Well, welcome everyone uh, to this uh, inaugural Type Media um, Center book talk with Sarah Osner and Anthea um, uh, Butler. And um, and I just want to say a little bit uh, to set, set the stage um, for our conversation. Um, the Type Media Center is um, a nonprofit that supports um, more than 100 um, writers and investigative journalists and authors. Um, it is home to bold type books. Um, it is home to uh, type media investigations. And it is home to a fellowship program that supports 25 fellows, um, all of whom are doing uh, investigative journalism and journalism that seeks to address issues of inequality of social justice, um, issues uh, that hopefully will catalyze conversations and social change. Um, and uh, in uh, this evening, we're, uh, we're beginning the first of what we hope will be a series of talks um, around books uh, with authors and public intele intellectuals who join. Um, I, before we go to um, introducing Sarah and Anthea, I want to encourage people to ask questions. And to do that, you do not go to the chat function. You go to the ask a question on this link. Um, and when you write out a question, uh, we'll be sorting through them as the conversation goes on. And eventually, uh, the best questions will be uh, posed to Sarah and Anthea. Um, so uh, about our um, distinguished um, speakers. Um, Sarah Posner is the author of Unholy, which I think will go down as the definitive book on how and why uh, evangelicals have come to see Donald Trump as their savior. Uh, she is a type media investigation fellow whose work has appeared uh, in the New Republic, the Huffington Post, the Nation, uh, and a host of other publications. Um, and Sarah, your book is, is so good and so original. I just want to um, emphasize to absolutely everyone uh, who's listening tonight to go out and buy it or order it while we're talking, hopefully not from Amazon, but from your local independent bookstore. Anthea Butler is um, a professor of um, religious studies and Africana at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, she is both a distinguished scholar and a public intellectual who writes for a wide variety of um, public venues. Um, and she is working on a book about evangelicals, politics, and race that uh, will be, if I understand it correctly, out next year. Um, and so we are so happy to have them both here. And we will open with Sarah and then Anthea um, just talking. <laughs> Thanks, Al. Um, so. As the title of my book suggests, there is a mystery at the center or an apparent mystery at the center of why white evangelicals remain uh, Donald Trump's most loyal base. And people often ask me the question, why do they support him when they claim to be a Christian and he doesn't, they claim to be Christian and he doesn't even pretend to be a Christian or he doesn't represent the values that they claim to, uh, to represent and to uh, argue for. And often people come to the conclusion that white evangelicals must have given up something in order to form an alliance with Donald Trump, that they compromised something to get a transactional uh, relationship with Donald Trump. So they gave up their values of uh, sexual purity and uh, commitment to these uh, conservative white evangelical views of the Bible um, in order for Trump to give them the judges that they want. But that's really asking the wrong question. They did not give up anything to support Donald Trump. Donald Trump represents their interests without them giving up anything. He is, despite not having all of the hallmarks of uh, a conservative uh, 
Christian or a conservative evangelical in terms of his uh, language or his biblical literacy, he represents a strand of um, right-wing politics that zeroes in on resentments and grievances about changes that took place in the second half of the 20th century in the United States, social and political and legal changes that the Christian right, despite its focus, its, its near uh, universal focus on abortion, um, that these issues were uh, the heart, these other issues around civil rights and social chains and social justice were the heart of why they became involved in politics in the 1970s and 80s. And Donald Trump represents those views so perfectly um, and that he uh, that they did not give up anything. They did not engage in a transaction with him. He represents a totalizing figure who represents their views and, and argues for their views that uh, political correctness is ruining America, that what they consider to be social engineering, i.e. civil rights and human rights and the government enforcing civil rights and human rights or the courts enforcing civil rights and human rights, um, that this represents some kind of social engineering that's undermining and subvert subverting the Christian America that God intended. And so while they're very happy with the end of the transaction that they've received. This is not a purely transactional relationship. This is an ideological relationship uh, that uh, in which they share and are willing to go along with his views on immigration and race and things that appear to be outside um, their uh, political commitments on uh, religion in the public square and LGBT rights and abortion. But these are, these are not, um, these are not incidental. These other things that Trump represents are not incidental to their support of him. They are central to it. Um, Anthea, do you want to, do you want to um, join in and, 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 sure. and, and, yeah. I can do that. Um, first of all, I want to just thank you all for inviting me to be here. It's great to be with Sarah. Um, I should say by way of introduction, that we met back in 2008 and we bonded over Sarah Palin. So <laughs> I think that that sets up the stage for what we're gonna talk about today because I think that it's really important to kind of get this as a history and I'm a historian. So what intrigued me about this book and made me really happy is that Sarah Palin is a historian even though she's a journalist, right? Because she's telling us a story that a lot of us don't pay attention to, a lot of us don't know. And that story has to do with figures that don't normally appear in what we would normally call the religious right. And this is the key when you're trying to understand Trump. And you said something very interesting, Sarah. You said, you know, not to look at Trump as this person who, you know, normally would get with evangelicals because of his morality. But I say, in spite of morality, they take him up anyway. And, and you understand why that is. And I think that the first thing that should be said about uh, Trump is that he's actually the recipient of a gift that was being built for a long time. Mm -hmm. It's not as though Trump just walked in and had all the talent and brought all these people together. They drew to him because of certain kinds of things that were already endemic within evangelicalism and brought them to the fore. So I kind of thought about this book in some different ways. And the first thing I want to talk about is not the usual suspects, you know, from the movie. These are suspects that we don't normally hear about. We don't normally hear about somebody like Paul Ryrick, who was actually a Catholic who kind of helped this whole thing really begin back in the 70s. And I think what people miss a lot of times about the story about Trump and evangelicals is that it's also a story about what has happened with Catholics too. That is really crucial to the story. And so if you look at the story without thinking about Catholics and evangelicals being together, you miss a big point about what's happening. So that's number one. The second group she introduces us to, which is you know very troubling, is the alt-right. And I don't know how to say this very nicely about evangelicals, but because they're kind of racist, this was all right for them. OK, and this is a story that everybody was really up in arms about. You know, we just recently had Trump tweeting out, you know, some little senior citizen riding around a golf cart hollering, you know, white, I love white people. What was it? White supremacy or something? White power. White power. Yeah. And I'm like, dude, you're in a golf cart. OK, 
like we could knock you over. Just remember that. It's not like you're driving a tank when you say this. So I'm thinking about the story in terms of what does it mean to have the alt-right come alongside of Trump? And everybody thinking, well, God, really, evangelicals shouldn't want this. But in fact, when we start thinking about people who've been part of the evangelical movement, and I'm thinking back to uh, Russus Rush Dooney and all these other kinds of folks way back at the back there, I think that we need to start to realize that maybe evangelicalism has a lot to do with whiteness. And I think that's the history that you're pointing us to, Sarah, but it's a certain kind of whiteness. It's a whiteness about how do you bring in ethnic people and make them look like they're part of things, right? How do you make them um, be a part of the abortion movement, right? So we have to talk about you know, that this is killing black people, it's black genocide, you know, MAFA and all these other things that have happened. So that's one. The other group that I'm really interested in, and she knows this because this is who I am, is Pentecostals. Because Pentecostals and Charismatics and televangelists and all those people come to Trump. And part of it is because, you know, he's a huckster, right? And he knows how to sell things. And part of that is about how they too have been involved in this religious right movement, but not in the ways that people are normally thinking about that they're involved in. So I like to think about the first interest of this into uh, presidential politics, obviously is Sarah Palin, but we have people who are part of this long before that. And Sarah's book really starts to introduce us to some of these characters in a way in which we can think about evangelicalism being more encompassing, okay? And so what I mean by all of this is that Trump receives a history. He gets a history that is already built and he walks in on it. So that's how he becomes King Cyrus. He doesn't become King Cyrus because he has great talent. The only talent he had was trying to fire people on TV and he can't even fire them in real life. So the problem becomes, how do you think about this? Let me add one more thing that I, I forgot to mention, which I think is really important. The other part of this is, is Russia and orthodoxy. I think that's a huge piece of a, of a segment that we haven't really looked at to see these relationships between evangelicals and the rest of the world. We usually think about evangelicals with Israel, but what Sarah's book does is to show us something that's very different, a different kind of relationship and how evangelicals movement around the world has created some interesting alliances that make them very powerful and make Trump very powerful because he hasn't had to go to the usual power brokers. Let me say the last thing, which I think is something that I think really gets missed a lot, but Sarah doesn't miss it. It is a combination of media and infrastructure, lobbying infrastructure that makes evangelicalism so strong. People tend to think about evangelicals as just nice people like sitting in Robert Jeffers church, singing songs without mask and you know, probably gonna be sick in two weeks. But it's not just that. This is an infrastructure that people move around in, people have relationships in, there's money to be made, there's money to get. And because of that, this was what makes this relationship between evangelicals and politics very strong. And this is the thing I think that we, especially in the media, need to pay attention to because we tend to just look at these dynamic figures who say crazy things. But it's more than just that. It's not just about the crazy statements. It's the people behind the crazy statements who are pulling the strings and make everything happen. And if I can, if I can um, pick up on that thread and um, and ask Sarah to unpack a little more of of what is is in this marvelous book, um, Sarah, there's a story about the religious right and where it came from and how it got mobilized, which goes basically like this: In 1973, Roe v. Wade is decided. Evangelical preachers are horrified. Jerry Falwell and others soon uh, come together and they organize the moral majority, primarily with an interest in saving the unborn. That's the way they would put it. Um, what's wrong with that story? Why is that story not the one you tell in your book? Because that story is not true. <laughs> it was only later that um, evangelicals recast the story to be about abortion, but as Paul Weirich, who Anthea mentioned in her introductory remarks, admitted in a number of different on a number of different occasions, um, he could not get evangelicals interested in abortion. Paul Weirich was the sort of premier uh, organ, political organizer um, and political activist 
who came to Washington in the late 1960s uh, determined to make a better infrastructure for the American right. He believed that far left organizations like the Brookings Institute um, were ruining politics. I say that sort of sarcastically because obviously the Brookings Institute is not a far, far left organization. Um, but he wanted to create an infrastructure for conservatives that he believed would counteract this uh, liberalism run amok in Washington. And so he came and he helped found organizations like the Heritage Foundation and ALEC and many conservative organizations that you've heard of. And he was instrumental in bringing evangelicals into this movement that was then known as the New Right. But as he admitted, he could not, he was Catholic, very conservative Catholic, and he was anti-abortion all along. But he could not get his evangelical friends to come along with his anti-abortion activism, even after Roe. And so he, in, in many different situations and to different interviewers and in different lectures that he gave, talked about how he could not get evangelicals interested in the abortion issue and that the issue that really animated them and got them involved in national politics and particularly in national electoral politics was school desegregation. So after Brown v. Board of Education in 1954, um, and after public schools started to desegregate, there were private schools that started to crop up. Some of them were known as segregation academies. They were explicitly founded to be segregated and to avoid public school desegregation. And then some of them were Christian schools, which were not explicitly segregation academies because the Christians who founded these schools um, also said that they were upset about uh, uh, the Supreme Court striking down mandatory school prayer in 1962 and Bible reading in 1962 and 1963 and other social changes that made them skeptical of sending their, their kids to government schools, as they like to call them. Um, but many of these uh, Christian schools were basically segregated. And so the IRS decided, look, if you're gonna have a tax exemption, right, and get that benefit from the American taxpayer, you cannot get that benefit by avoiding this important public policy that we're trying to implement in integrating our schools. And this caused a huge uproar um, in the Christian school movement. And the man who was at the center of that was a good friend of Wyrick's. His name was Bob Billings, and he was a leader in the Christian school movement. And he eventually became the uh, first executive director of the Moral Majority. And his central issue was no doubt this claim that the IRS coming after the, um, the uh, Christian schools uh, was a violation of Christians' religious freedom. And people might be familiar with the leading case about this, the Bob Jones University case, which was a lot of these uh, Christian schools were K through 12 schools, but the uh, Bob Jones University was a college that had its tax exempt status revoked because it had a ban on interracial dating on campus. And this became a leading cause for the modern Christian right. And it still hangs over everything that the Christian right does. So for example, the idea that the, that the IRS could infringe on the rights of Christians uh, hangs over, say, Obergefell, the Supreme Court decision legalizing same-sex marriage. They complained that maybe the, the IRS would start yanking the tax exempt status of colleges and universities that oppose same sex marriage. And even the recent case um, on Title VII, um, defining sex as including um, sexual orientation and gender identity, there was a lot of talk of like, what is going to happen? Is there going to be another Bob Jones situation? So even though it originally had to do with race, and now primarily has to do with sexual orientation and gender identity, the through line here, and the through one of the through lines in my book is that this grievance about civil rights for other people infringing on the rights of Christians who oppose the government, act, the, the court action or the government action um, is really a very, it was an, the animator to bring evangelicals into the Christian right well before abortion was. 
Anthea, do you want to do you want to add to that or just comment on it? Um, and and in particular, I think what what Sarah mentions there that that this was this is not framed in the, in your telling as opposition to integration. It's yeah. framed as an infringement on rights, but it's the rights of those who actually want to segregate. Yeah, exactly. Um, they want the right to segregate. They want the right to have the white segregation academy. So it's not about so much. If you think about the beginning of the case, we've got to go back just a little bit. The other thing that get, doesn't get mentioned is to talk about the, the black uh, people who bought the case, the beginning case of Mississippi about a school, and then it goes over to Bob Jones and all of this stuff. That's getting in the weeds. But yeah, I think you know one of the things that what, what happens with this is that you say, oh, it's about religious liberty. Oh, it's not about infringement. But it's also about, we don't want race mixing. We only want this a certain way. And, and one of the things I've been really thinking about in my, in my research is this intersection between the government doing things for African Americans, which, you know, what ends up happening in the 80s is that we say, you know, welfare queens and all of this other stuff, and how this, this kind of language really signals evangelicals, right? Because it signals them to think about, oh, well, we don't want the IRS messing and stuff, but we don't want the government to give them anything either. And so there's this kind of push me, pull you that's happening, but it's all on the same level about what we what they don't want to have happen. So I think this is a really important part to start to think about when we begin to think about how this all started and where we are now, because the same kinds of pushbacks that we see now have a lot to do with what happened back in the 70s. Um, Sarah, do you want to say more or, or just maybe um, talk a little bit about how I mean, you, you, you make this very provocative uh, argument that um, it's not in spite of uh, Trump's views on immigration and race that evangelicals are willing to, you know, in, in a sense, hold their nose and, and wait for judges who will overturn abortion. Mm -hmm. It's because of his views on immigration and race, um, that that is actually a pull, not a deterrent in any way. Um, so, I mean, I, I'll just caveat that by saying that there are some, there is a segment of white evangelicals who oppose Trump's views and policies on immigration but they have largely been marginalized by um, the evangelicals who have circled around Trump and formed this cult of personality around him where they praise him and stand behind him no matter what he does or no matter what happens, right? So if you think about the trajectory of his presidency from you know the Russia the Mueller investigation Charlottesville uh, family separations impeachment I'm just ticking off sort of the big events but like there were a lot of smaller events that happened in between and these white evangelicals stood behind him meanwhile evangelicals like Russell Moore a very prominent Southern Baptist who I talk quite a lot about in the book who was a Trump critic during the campaign and um, people thought was going to be kind of this new leading light of evangelicalism who would like bring this sort of softer edge um, without all of the Christian nationalism and the, and the ugly rhetoric. Um, he has been basically, you know, shunted aside and marginalized by this very powerful group of evangelical elites who continue to support Trump. And I think that in terms of the evangelical base, you know, it was the base that really started to go for Trump before the elites decided to go along. I think that they had been so committed, this was back in 2015, 2016, they had been so committed to their narrative that their candidate had to be a good Christian and go to church all the time and only been married once and all of that stuff, um, that they really couldn't, some of them couldn't see Trump, right? But then they saw that the base was really going for him and the base was going for him because of the way he ran his rallies, because of the things he said about immigrants, because he made them feel like he was going to restore America and an America that they believed had been lost. Um, you, you, you document all of that. And yet you also, um, at various points, uh, illustrates an, another dynamic that, that Anthea t touched on um, in, in her opening remarks about sort of, and I've seen people posting on the side here, when we say evangelicals, we should say white evangelicals. And you do actually in your title, in your subtitle, but there are various moments in your book where you talk about these diversity groups 
that have been instrumentalized within the evangelical community to, in a sense, show that Trump is not, in fact, appealing to white Christians only. Can, can you both just address that a little bit? Well, there have been a number over the years, including during Weyrich's era, too, a number of efforts to bring um, Black and Latino evangelicals into this movement and to make it seem like we're not just white people, like we're very diverse. Um, and in some instances, that's true. Like in the world of televangelism, a lot of the churches are quite diverse. I mean, some of Trump's uh, televangelist supporters, including Paula White, who's his top spiritual advisor, they have followers and congregations that are quite diverse. Um, but it's really kind of window dressing for other white followers of Trump and these and and these religious figures to 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 create a certain show, right? And Trump himself created um, during his. Uh, 2016 campaign, a national diversity coalition. Um, there's a coalition for his 2020 re-election campaign called Blacks for Trump. But, you know, as we know from polling data, most Black voters, the, the overwhelming majority of Black voters do not like Trump. And so it's really, it's, it's like I said, window dressing or a little bit of a show. And I'm not trying to diminish the, you know, that there may be people who are genuinely uh, committed to this, uh, but uh, it it really strikes me as more of a display for white people to feel more comfortable that he has a diverse following. Yeah, exactly. Anthea, do you want to? Oh yeah, let me let me take this one because I saw that comment. <laughs> and to the com to the person who said, "Say white evangelicals," I'm going to say something to you. There used to be a black evangelical. There used to be a black national black evangelical association. But I don't like to call, like, say white, you know, say white evangelicals because I'm sorry. What the media has done is that evangelicalism is white, okay? So it doesn't matter if you say black evangelical or white evangelical. Or ever evangelicalism means white, and everybody sort of knows this under the face. And all the black people and the people of color are sitting there are basically tr being told they need to be culturally white. And what do I mean by that? You got to sing the songs. You got to do the stuff. You got to dress like them. I'm thinking about Harry, Bishop Harry Jackson and all these people who have surrounded themselves with Trump. And there's a thing about you, you can have an evangelical of color there, but you are expected, you know, to take on white evangelical kinds of practices and behaviors. So the first thing is, is that we have to understand that the terminology, it doesn't matter if you say white or black, the supposition is white. Okay. And so if we go with that, first of all, then you have to think about, well, what are all these other people of color doing there? What I think that they're doing there is to portray this colorblind kind of evangelicalism. In other words, we don't see race. Well, of course, the moment you tell me you don't see race, you see race, you just don't <laughs> want to deal with it. Okay. That's one. Number two is it's good for the PR. Because if you want to do, say, for instance, let's talk about abortion in the black community. How are we going to get them together? How can we make them be more moral? How can we do all this stuff? You use race to deploy that. So whiteness is the baseline of everything. It's not just this kind of thing that we can say white evangelical or black evangelical. I think when you say evangelical, you mean white. And you may disagree with me about that, but I've been reading it too long and too far. And I just think we just need to call it what it is. So the other part, and I just want to say this really quickly, in the Pentecostal realm, these, these people who are in the televangelist world, whether that's, you know, the Mark Burns, who he had, you know, speaking for him and all of this stuff, there's a sense in which this harkens back to history. It says, oh, this is like Pentecostalism. It was colorblind. This is going to make Jesus come soon. So it's, it's partially theological, but it's also about the window dressing that it creates. And Trump did get a, you know, a, a percentage of black male voters. And I think he would like to get some this time. He doesn't get black women, but he can get black men. And if he continues with this, he needs a whole new set of people, you know, more than just Daryl Scott and everybody else this time. But I think what he's doing is very shrewd because evangelicals have been doing this the whole time. Okay, I just wanted to add one more thing in this current moment. Um, what I've noticed in terms of how 
the Trump supporting white evangelicals are talking about Black Lives Matter is that they'll say something along the lines of, well, what happened to George Floyd was horrible. But, and there's always a but, but, you know, we can't defund the police and why are our, you know, why is our heritage being torn down with these statues? And, you know, so it's like, it, it takes this, it, it portrays the uh, killing of George Floyd as just this isolated incident, the bad apples sort of argument about the police. And then it segues into, we must support the police. We must keep our heritage and our history and our monuments and our statues and defund the police is a Marxist, um, a Marxist socialist conspiracy that is going to, you know, cause riots and mob rule in the streets. I mean, that's essentially like how that argument is playing out in these circles right now. Um, I want to, before we turn to the audience's questions, and I promise we will, um, I wanted to ask you both um, how you go about talking to people in this world that you both write about and that um, it, part of what you write about is the sort of suspicion of secular Americans, um, the hostility and the sense of embattled, you know, we, it's them against us. And yet, you know, Sarah, in your book, you're sitting down again and again with the folks you've been talking about uh, in the last half hour. Um, I'm curious how you navigate that and what lets you in and, 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 and why those conversations happen. And Anthea, I'm curious for your view of, of that. Well, sometimes all you have to do is ask. <laughs> and sometimes people say no, right? Some people say they don't want to talk to you. Um, when you encounter people at a conference, for example, a lot of them are very just skeptical of the media in general. Um, if you write for a, what they consider to be a secular outlet, but the, the media is, you know, and Trump has made this worse, obviously, the suspicion of the media. Um, but I also think that a lot of people who I talk to want to talk to the media. They want to convey their point of view. They don't want to just be portrayed as somebody who said one crazy thing that is taken out of context. They want to be portrayed as a, as a real human being. And I think that if you just ask and you ask questions that engage them, then a lot of people are willing to talk to you. Um, I, don't, I don't want to engage them in a kind of gotcha question way. Um, I am genuinely interested and curious about what they have to say about the things that I'm asking them about. And so I think if you come to them with that kind of perspective, then they're more likely to engage with you too. Anthea. Yeah, on my part, it's it's really interesting because, you know, here I'm going to out myself a little bit. I went to an evangelical seminary before I did my PhD. I went to Fuller. Mm -hmm. So I know the lingo and I can talk to people in a way that immediately lets them know I know who they are. And and I have, you know, certain kinds of things you could say. Sarah does too, because she's been to enough church services and meetings and all this. And you really need to have that language there. That's the first part. But the second part I think is really interesting is that when I'm a, a African-American woman going into these white spaces, something very interesting happens. And I'll tell a story from when I was um, doing some work, researching Sarah Palin. I actually was in, I believe it was, um, it was Tulsa, Oklahoma. And I went to see her at a rally. This was before she announced that she wasn't going to run for president. And I was there at the rally and these women made friends with me. And we rode back on a van together to the airport. And so they asked me what I did. And I never tell people I'm a professor. I say, I'm a teacher, right? So it, it, it kind of levels it out a little bit. And then they just said, well, where do you teach? And I said, Philadelphia. She's like, oh, there's so much darkness there. How do you survive? And I just went, well, yeah, it's dark because it's 47% African American. Uh, what do you mean by being dark, right? And I just, you know, I knew they meant spiritual, spiritual things, but it was like, oh my God, this this whole thing is just like it washes over you. And you know, they thought I'm living in this terrible big city and it must be really horrible. And I'm like, well, I kind of really like this big city, and it's not as bad as you think, but it's the way in which 
these kinds of things get couched, whether we're talking about small town America is code word for white and, and how do we parse all that out? It depends on when you when you walk in a place. And if I walked in Paula White's church, I just need to be dressed properly. And she wouldn't think anything else different for me than I'm just another person. And she'd try to shake me down for my, you know, my tithe and my offering. But that's another story. Hmm. Fascinating. Um, I'm going to go to the questions that have been posed. Um, this is a question from Terry Shoemaker. Um, who says, I've seen a recent PRRI poll that shows a slight slip in white evangelical support for Trump. Any idea why this might be happening now? And to couple with that question, what do you imagine it would take for white evangelicals broadly to rethink their support for Trump and the GOP? Very timely question. Okay, so I'm familiar with the PRRI poll that um, Libby, was what, was that, what was the name of the? Question or I'm sorry, um, uh, Terry, 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 Terry um, that Terry refers to. Um, it showed that it, it was some week during June that his support had slipped to something like 60 something percent among white evangelicals. Now, we all remember that 81 percent number. That's the percentage of white evangelicals he got the votes of in 2016. But throughout his presidency and also throughout his uh, general election campaign in 2016, his support did fluctuate from among white evangelicals from the mid 60s to the high 70s. I mean, this is a normal fluctuation for him. Uh, and in fact, his support in September of 2016 among white evangelicals was around 65, 66%. And that was before the Access Hollywood tape came out. And after the Access Hollywood tape came out, um, it was uh, you know 81% during the election. So I wouldn't put too much stock in these snapshot polls. I think a lot of people assume that um, people are unhappy, voters are that white evangelical voters are unhappy with him for the same reasons that other voters are unhappy with him. And I think that's an incorrect assumption. I think some white evangelicals will be unhappy with him because of his handling of the Black Lives Matter protests or his handling of the pandemic. Um, but there may be other reasons why white evangelicals might be, you know, not as enthusiastic at this moment, but they will come back. Um, not all of them. I think he will see some slippage in that support just because of how outrageous he's been of late. Um, but I think that white evangelicals are going to get really um, hammered by the Trump campaign and the political organizations that um, will be pushing for Trump's reelection uh, with doomsday scenarios about what's going to happen with the Supreme Court um, if Biden were to win conspiracy theories about um, Marxism and socialism, if Joe Biden becomes president, that, you know, AOC will be some sort of shadow government or whatever. Um, and, uh, and disinformation, um, just disinformation beyond conspiracy theories, just like sort of flat out factual uh, disinformation. So um, I think people are enticed by that, that slippage and um but i think that we have a long way to go until november so to build on that question anthea anthea what do you think of um there was a there was a piece by damon linker um mm -hmm. after the um title seven ruling of the supreme court uh in which he said neil gorsuch just torpedoed trump's re-election um because uh he disappointed <laughs> you're, you're, you're not convinced yeah. um, the, yeah. this, the, the argument being they got the Supreme Court justice and in fact, he ruled against what they wanted and therefore they won't come out for him. You don't buy no, it. No, 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 that's not it. Because you see, it doesn't matter. If he rules for it, it's great. If he rules against it, it means they're embattled and they need to hang on and fight. Either way, they can fundraise. It just doesn't matter. And I think this is what people really need to understand about evangelicals. It's like, if they lose, they're the underdog. If they win, God bless them. You know, either way, they're winning because they get what they want. And so I think this is really hard for, you know, for somebody to really kind of understand politically because you're just thinking, but I don't understand. Why does this work? It works because that's how their worldview works. 
And I saw Sarah was going to say something. Yeah. So, I mean, the other thing about Gorsuch's opinion in the Title VII case was he did leave open this possibility in the opinion that someone could raise a religious objection, an employer could raise an, a religious objection to being held to this um, uh, non-discrimination against um, LGBTQ people. Uh, and so because he left that open, he, um, he gave them a little glimmer of hope. The other thing is, though, that beyond that, beyond the uh, Gorsuch's little window that he left for them, is that they know that should the next president have the opportunity to replace one of the liberal justices, they want that president to be Trump, not Biden. Yeah, exactly. And and same principle with what just happened with the abortion ruling. There's a loophole there. Come back and give me a case that I can deal yeah. with. Roberts right. is like, don't give me this crap. Don't bring the same thing up twice. Give me a case like we can deal with so I can help you. But don't be sloppy. That's basically what happened, you know, yesterday. So um from politics to lifestyle, um, a question from Amy. Could you talk about why so many evangelicals are against wearing masks? Uh, I don't know if that's part of what you've given that much thought or, or, or I, it's not well, a book, I don't, obviously. I don't know. I mean, I actually don't know um, that evangelicals oppose wearing masks at a higher rate than other conservatives mm -hmm. do. Um, so I don't, I don't really have a real thought on that. I did notice um, that on Sunday, Vice President Pence went to speak at the church of Robert Jeffress, who's a very close religious advisor to Trump, and he's very close with the White House. And they both wore masks, um, and both Pence and Jeffress wore masks. Most people in the audience, it looked like from the video, were wearing masks. However, the 100 person choir was not wearing masks, and we all know about singing. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, I, I, I don't know that evangelicals are at more anti mask than other, other conservatives mm -hmm. are. Yeah, I just wrote a piece about this for NBC Think. And um, one mm -hmm. of the things I, you know, if we think back a week to when Trump went out to Phoenix, I think this is like a political signaling. So in other words, we don't wear a mask if we're going to see, you know, certain things. Now, if you can compare the time for Phoenix and then the time to Dallas, we got some more bad news about the virus, right? So I, I don't know if we can say, like Sarah said, we don't have any polling to tell us or anybody to tell us empirically. But I do think the people who aren't wearing a mask and might be evangelical are also these people who are going to say, I don't want you to infringe on my freedoms. This is, you know, the freedom that I have. I'm thinking about the woman who everybody's probably seen, who was screaming at the stand saying, God gave us this thing to breathe with. You know, it goes in and out. We have, you know, um, oxygen and, and carbon monoxide and we should be able to do this. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is so crazy. So a lot of these yeah. objections have been religious, but I'm not sure where that's coming from. It might mm -hmm. be a sense in which it's also conspiracy theory stuff too. So it's always hard to tell. Yeah. Yeah, we have we have a really important question uh, from Jason Pudlow, um, who um, says, "Sarah, he's so excited to see your to, to see your book. Um, can you speak a bit about how your work relates to some of the other new research on religion, partisanship, and nationalism?" Um, and we haven't actually talked that much about the alt right, and mm -hmm. I wonder if maybe you wanna want to unpack that a little and connect it to, because I, I thought some of the most fascinating stuff in your book was, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you spoke to Bannon or, but you certainly mm -hmm. studied him very closely yeah. and seemed on to very early on to the idea that, um, uh, you know, there, the alt-right was simply not big enough um, to carry an election. Um, mm -hmm. And there had to be a fusion. And the fusion he envisioned was this kind of alt-right meets, um, as, you, as you tell it, um, conservative religious America. Right. And this was something that I was not, when I met Bannon at the Republican convention in 2016, I had not really fully understood how this was coming together. Um, I was watching, I had been covering um, for type, uh, and which was the Nation Institute back then, <laughs> uh, how, um, how the, um, 
the alt right was getting excited and energized about Trump and how they they were they seemed to be more energized by Trump. They were more energized by Trump um, than by any other presidential candidate ever, um, except maybe George Wallace, which is another uh, topic I cover in the book, uh, which is worth um, reading that history that we don't have time to get into right now. Um, but yeah, so Bannon, um, it was there that Bannon said to me, you know, Breitbart is the, plat the platform for the alt-right. He owned it, right? Um, and he owned the nationalism. He owned, he, he tried to deflect that it was white nationalism, but he owned the ethnic nationalism. And he um, owned that he thought that the alt-right needed conservative evangelicals and Catholics in order to beat back what he called the progressive left. And this was a kind of revelatory for me that, that, that he was being so deliberate about it. I think that there was a lot of, there were a lot of things going on that weren't necessarily deliberate, but there was more of a, like a kismet in that the uh, alt-right was looking to autocrats in Europe, these new right-wing autocrats like Orban and Putin too, um, and had been much more explicitly tied to that kind of ideology than the Christian right was. But then when I started to do more reporting and unpack that, it became evident that the Christian right too, even before Trump, had been looking to Eastern Europe and particularly leaders like Orban or Putin, who weren't necessarily religious themselves, but made a lot of religious pleas about the country's religious heritage and re reigniting or um, restarting the country's religious heritage as a form of nationalism. Um, and that was very appealing to a lot of um, elites in the Christian right. I don't know how much that has trickled down had, at that point had trickled down to the grassroots. Um, but then it became more clear to me how these various strands of nationalism, whether it was ethno nationalism or Christian nationalism were coming together in looking eastward for um, for what what represented a good and virtuous country, as opposed mm -hmm. to America, which was sliding down into political correctness and all of this, you know, terrible cultural Marxism and social engineering and all the buzzwords that they use to um, demonize social justice and civil rights and a liberal democracy. Anthea, do you want to add to that or should I go to another question? I could go to uh, another question since we might run out of time and I want to make sure. And yeah, Sarah answered so that there really are great. A couple of people have asked variations of a question about what place is there for a religious left? Um, and um, Reverend Barber's uh, movement has been mentioned. And um, I know that's not the focus of your book, Sarah. It's probably not the focus, Anthea, of your forthcoming book, but. Um, do you want to just say a little bit about yeah, where I, we are? I, what, I do yeah. want to say something about that because there's been this argument back and forth on Twitter about this. And so first thing first. And where all good arguments take place. Yes, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yes. You know, Reverend Barber is not an evangelical, okay? His denomination is not evangelical. So don't call him an evangelical, all right? And that's that's the first thing I need to say. I think there is a place for the religious left. The question is going to be, what does the religious left do in this moment? And the, the messy part about this is that, you know, we got to put the black church in this conversation because the person who wanted me to say white evangelical, I'm assuming that you think there's black evangelical and there is to a certain extent, but I can't say that I'm going to call every black church a black evangelical church. They may have similar beliefs to evangelicals about homosexuality or abortion, but that doesn't make them evangelical, okay? It doesn't make them evangelical theologically, and it doesn't make them evangelical politically. So that's one. The second is, I think, you know, if we're going to think about what could the religious left do during this time period, it's not going to be about coming right at Trump. It's going to be about attacking race, and it's going to be about what we need to do about the virus, and also what we need to do about people, you know, having a living wage, getting rid of kids on the board on the border, and and not making immigration so hard. 
those are the kinds of issues I think if people who consider themselves to be a religious left will get more traction on than coming straight at Trump because it just ends up being a culture war if you do that. And I think that's the that's the bigger problem about the left is people expect that the left is supposed to fight the right. And I'm like, no, 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 don't do that. Come after the things that are really important that are gonna help people that the religious left was about in the first place. And I think that people should not expect the religious left to look like a mirror image of the religious right. Um, mostly because um, the religious right made itself an indispensable and critical part of the Republican Party without whom the Republican Party could not win elections. Um, and the Democratic Party is just configured in a much different way and is much more secular and not religious and much uh, less homogenous. And so it just, if people are sort of expecting there to be um, a religious left version of the religious right with the Democratic Party, it's, that's not a reasonable expectation. Mm. Um, I'm going to ask one, one question I'm just curious about that's, that's sort of, uh, and then we'll go back to audience. Um, do you think that um, if Trump loses, um, it could uh, create the kind of the, the sense of disillusionment that that um, will will lead to disengagement. I know that in the history of, of evangelicalism, there have been sort of ebbs and flows of um, disengagement with worldly affairs and engagement um, since the 70s and, and all of the events you describe in the book. Um, they've been very, very involved and mobilized. Is there any prospect that if your savior fails uh, to deliver what you want, um, you go back to worshiping? Uh, you're both laughing, not buying this at all. Um, no. So, well, first of all, I think that they um, Trump's religious right base has been so convinced by the uh, that that the Democratic Party and the deep state and the fake news media and all the rest of their conspiratorial uh, bogeymen are out to get Trump. So they don't see Trump as failing at anything, right? That's the first thing. And then the second thing is they are they're not letting him. Right. He's being undermined by his enemies. Right. So he's not failing to do things. You know, so, uh, you know, Neil Gorsuch turned out to be a disappointment as opposed to Trump screwed up by nominating Neil Gorsuch. Right. Um, and, you know, Gorsuch has plenty of opportunities to redeem himself in their eyes, I think. So but I think that because they see themselves as being under siege and that they need they really need the courts to carve out these religious exemptions for them and to undermine the separation of church and state for them as they the courts have been marching steadily to do over the past several decades. They need that to continue uh, so that they can continue to carve out these special places for conservative Christians who object to all of the stuff that the rest of the country is not just okay with, but enthusiastic about like LGBT rights and, and abortion rights and all of these, you know, immigration, what have you. Um, so in any case, I don't think that this will cause them to disengage. I think that it will cause them to look for a new Trump, perhaps somebody who's a little less uh, chaotic uh, and but can articulate their, uh, their ideas in a similarly pugnacious way. Mm. Yeah, they're not yeah. going anywhere. They're not going anywhere. Mm. And I mean, and you know, the other part of it is, is that if Trump loses, as Sarah said, it's everybody else's fault and it's a conspiracy, right? But it will harden them even more. If you can imagine them getting harder, that's what's gonna happen. And it will be really tough between November and January if that occurs. If he wins, well, we're both moving to Canada or someplace, so you can talk about <laughs> from there. Um, I, we have maybe one last question. Just can you, can you talk a little bit about young evangelicals and the, um, the, the media loves the story and I've uh, certainly flirted with writing about this myself and, and I know the trope goes around all the time that there's a new generation of evangelicals and they don't see things the way their elders do. They have different views on race, they have different views on gay marriage, they have different views on um, uh, issues of social tolerance, um, they're moderate. Is that true or is that 
wishful thinking among, uh, you know, the mainstream media that's kind of looking from the outside into this world. Yeah. So you, the media does love this story. They love this story. And um, it is polling data shows us that um, younger evangelicals are uh, more for LGBT rights. Uh, they tend to be still like their elders on the abortion issue. And yes, they, um, they're more tolerant on race issues and immigration and so forth. Um, but on the other hand, the evangelical world is very, um, I think that, I think that outsiders do not understand how, uh, sprawling and, uh, interconnected different evangelical organizations and churches and conferences and media and social media are so that people really can live in this bubble where they are exposed only to um, this kind of thinking. And yes, there are younger evangelicals who go to college at a secular college and they get exposed to other ideas and then they might become more moderate or liberal. And that's true and that happens. And um, I think there's evidence for that happening uh, more um, and, and evangelical, younger evangelicals leaving evangelicalism. On the other hand, there's still people who are wrapped up in this insular world where they don't get exposed to that much other ways, that many other ways of thinking. And they might be um, caught up in one of these uh, charismatic or Pentecostal communities where, you know, they pray 24 seven and there's like a lot of fasting and a lot of, um, you know, just uh, not a lot of exposure to the outside world. So mm -hmm. I think that, polling data can only tell us so much. And because the infrastructure for this movement has been built over many, many decades and funded, very well funded for many, many decades, they still have the ability to um, repeat the cycle. Um, but it is true, on the other hand, that the you know 18 to 29 year old cohort is less white and less religious. Um, but that still doesn't tell us where they'll be when they're 35 or 40, right? So I think there are a lot of factors that go into this. They're not all political. A lot of them are cultural and social and social pressure and um, and that sort of uh, ide ideological formation for people. Uh, so I think it remains to be seen. I'm not going to make any predictions. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anthea, do you want to add to that? Or, I think um, the only thing I'll add to this is that I, I'm more concerned about the ones that are just leaving and never coming back. Those are the ones that interest me. Because I think the ones that stay, they're going to hold on to the number one thing that every evangelical holds on to, which is, you know, abortion, right? It, it's not ever going to be race with those because they think, you know, I live in a different kind of world than my parents did, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? But I am interested in the evangelicals who are leaving and never coming back. Because those are the ones I think are what have been termed ex evangelicals on Twitter. I think those are the ones that have the axe to grind in a way, and the ones that actually really know the movement in a different kind of way. And so I'm wondering what that looks like in 10 years. And, and you know, we're going to have a big drop off now. All bets are off, and I'll just keep saying this all bets are off depending on how many people die because yeah. that's going to be a whole nother big thing. The pandemic is the X factor of everything right now. And I think that this will, if, if a lot of people end up dying, this is going to crush an evangelical worldview about God saving them from everything. It's not going to matter about Trump. What's going to matter is, is that God has forsaken them. And so they're going to have to come up with a narrative about this virus. And I think we're going to see that happen in the next six months. So stay tuned. So I would I just wanted to add one more thing that touches on on the major one of the major themes in my book, and that is we don't really know yet how this alliance with um, white or ethno nationalism 
is going to alter evangelicalism. And uh, because a lot of the young people that I met when I was doing my reporting on the alt-right, a lot of them were not religious or they considered themselves to be pagan. Um, but a lot of them were considered themselves to be Christian. And they, um, and that was fascinating to me um, because of the way that they interpreted Christianity, not necessarily in the way that the Christian right does or the way evangelicals do, but like to support the idea that we should like live in a monarchy, for example, um, a sort of Bill Barr-esque view of religion. Uh, so I think that those kinds of social changes that are happening right now I think in terms of how that's going to affect this conser this uh, the conservative movement and the American right in general is um, possibly something that we're not taking into account right now. Thank you both so much. Um, we are going to wrap up. We finished an hour um, and you have enlightened everyone who's listened in, both of you. And um, so to the audience, just one more time, please go and um, from your local bookstore, if you can, um, or local uh, outlet, um, order Sarah's book um, and put Anthea's uh, book on your list of books to read uh, next year when it when it comes out. Follow them both on um, Twitter and uh, their work in various media outlets and follow Type Media Center because there will be um, future discussions like this um, and we look forward to seeing you at them. So thank you both. Thank, thank you. you.